All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Trivially Relocatable. Uh, I'm Arthur O'Dwyer. Um, and yeah, let's get started because we have a lot of stuff to cover and I'm already two minutes into my time, apparently. So you're all here to hear about Trivially Relocatable. Um, you're going to hear everything about it, assuming we have time to cover it. Uh, we're going to start with what is relocation and motivate um, the uh, applications for it. I've got five applications that I promised in the uh, abstract. Uh, we're going to talk about some prior art, how it's currently being done by uh, real people in the field right now at Facebook, Electronic Arts, and Bloomberg, uh, and why that's fragile and error prone. I'm going to pick on one of them. Um, then I'm going to tell you how I propose to solve it. I'm going to do a little nutshell of the proposal, um, but that's a very small part of this talk because in part two I'm going to com be comparing it to past and current proposals uh, and versus things you might think it is but it actually is not. Uh, I'm going to present some open questions that we probably won't have time to discuss here, but get me at lunch. Um, and then bonus slides if we have time. There are slide numbers down there. Sometimes there are URLs in the upper corner that uh, if you have uh, a connection to Godbolt you can go look at these examples live. Um, as of a few days ago, I've broken dwarf debugging. Um, so uh, you may have to add dash g0 to some of these examples to get them to compile if you're doing it live. If you're watching this on YouTube, it probably doesn't matter. It's already fixed. All right. Um, motivating relocation. Uh, consider what happens when we resize or re uh, reserve in a std vector, uh, and it's already at capacity. So I have a vector of four elements. I try to add a fifth element. There's no more capacity. I need to reallocate the uh, dynamic buffer here, right? So I go to my memory allocator, whatever it is. I get a bigger chunk of memory. I am place E into there. And then I need to get A, B, C, D from where they are down into the vector, right? Um, so today, the relocation of objects A, B, C, D from the old buffer to the new buffer is accomplished by four calls to the move constructor and then four calls to the destructor. Uh, on some libraries, these calls will be interleaved and some they won't. Doesn't really matter. You're still making eight function calls to move constructors and destructors. Um, and it is likely that neither of them is trivial. Uh, here's an example where they are trivial. Int star is trivially copyable. Um, all libraries know, you know, the people who wrote the libraries put in an optimization to say, if I'm just relocating int star, which is trivially copyable, right? I can take it from one place and just call memcopy to get it down the other place because it doesn't have ownership semantics, right? Uh, so I just call memcopy to get the stuff down where it is. Um, really efficient assembly. Really efficient assembly also on uh, libstid C++. Um, and so that's great. This is cool. However, if I am relocating uh, shared putter, shared putter is, does have ownership semantics. It is non-trivially move constructible. It is non-trivially destructible. Those have to do work. So when I call the move constructor and the destructor of shared putter in a loop, uh, that generates a whole bunch more code. Um, and you'll notice it is not trivial code either. I mean, I see calls uh, in GCC. It's uh, making function calls. Uh, it's doing lock x add l, whatever that is. On the other side, I see a call to pthread key create. Like, this is non trivial code in every sense. Um, however, um, when I take those shared putters from one place, ownership you know, exists in that one place, and I move them down the other place, and I destroy the originals, I haven't really changed anything. I could have just used memcopy for that, taken the bit pattern from one place to the other. As long as I didn't call either the move constructor or the destructor, I just need to get the bits over there, and as soon as I start interpreting them as shared putters, it's going to work fine. Um, so the operation of calling move constructor destructor, I call that relocation. Um, and in this case, uh, not just for int star, but even for shared putter and unique putter and a whole bunch of types, uh, their relocation operation taken as a whole is equivalent to memcopy. I call this a trivially relocatable type. Just like a trivially copyable type is one where you can copy it with memcopy, a trivially relocatable type is one where the relocation operation could be accomplished with memcopy. It is safe. Um, now, if your uh, relocation operation is not tantamount to memcopy, we call that non-trivially relocatable. So there do exist non-trivially relocatable types. Some of them are pretty common. Std list is an example. Um, and let's see an example of that. So we have uh, two types here, forward list, the singly linked list, and we have std list, the doubly linked list. Um, one of them is trivially relocatable, the other isn't. Here's forward list, right? The, um, all that stuff on the right side of the arrows, that's all heap allocated, but my forward list itself holds a next pointer to the first element of the forward list, right? It doesn't even know its size. Um, and it turns out that if I have a forward list object, which remember is only this part, right? Everything else is heap allocated. I can take that footprint of that forward list and I can memcopy it somewhere else. And uh, it is still a valid forward list 
in every sense. Right? So it is trivially relocatable. Uh, I left this gray arrow. Uh, the footnote says uh, the, the memory at the old address uh, will still hold the bit pattern of a pointer to the first element of the list. But because relocation is taking the object from where it is, ending that object's lifetime, and starting a, a new lifetime somewhere else, that C++ object's lifetime is over. We're never going to look at it again. It would be undefined behavior to look at it again. We've already destroyed it. Right? Now, stidlist, on the other hand, is actually a circularly doubly linked list. Um, inside the footprint of the list object itself, we have a sort of uh, truncated uh, list node. It has a pre and a next pointer. The next pointer points to the first element of the list, and the pre points to the last element of the list, so that we have an efficient way of, call of getting end on a, on a doubly linked list. Right? And when I call end on a, a uh, on a list, I actually get a pointer to this truncated list node. That's so that when I minus minus it, I follow its pre-pointer, I get the last element of the list. This is cool. Um, however, if I were to take this list and memcopy it, oops, uh, these pointers would get up to, you know, these, these pointers, for example, if this pointer's ad, um, value was 0x42, right, memory address 0x42, and I take that bit pattern and I memcopy it down here, it's still 0x42, it still points to the same place. Awesome. The problem is, by just memcopying the footprint of the std list, those pointers out there on the heap still point back to the old object. I didn't update them. Right? So this operation is not trivial. If I want to relocate a std list, I have to do something more than just copy the bits. I have to actually go out and fiddle those two pointers. Um, so std list is non-trivially relocatable. Right? All right. So. We have these two classes of types, the trivial ones and the non-trivial ones. And if we could reliably distinguish them in the library, uh, then we could use memcopy for the former class, and we could use uh, non-trivial move and destroy for the latter class. And we would get correct code all the time. We would only use the optimization when it was safe. Right? But only using the optimization when it's safe requires that you know when it's safe. So let's teach libc++ that shared putter is trivially relocatable and see what improvement we get on our vector example. Again, there's a URL up there. You can go test, test it. This code should still work. Um, so on Godbolt, there is a custom branch here, p144. Um, and here I have a vector of shared putters, and I am reallocating it. And that reallocation can be accomplished with memcopy. Uh, in just a little bit more code than it took to do the trivial example, the uh, instar example. Over here on a stock libc++ with a stock clang, uh, it's about three times as long. So I've got faster code, and you notice it's still got calls to pthread key create and all sorts of crazy stuff. So um, I can do faster code and I can do three times smaller on this toy example. But wait, there's more. This is the stuff that's new. If you saw my talk last year, how many people saw my talk last year? A lot of people in this room. All right. Welcome, everybody else. Um, let's talk about some other applications. So if we have a reliable way of detecting trivial relocatable types, um, we can optimize the move operations of fixed capacity vector. Uh, fixed capacity vector is being proposed as static vector. It's also in boost container as static vector. I don't like that name. There's nothing static about it. But its capacity is fixed. That's the important thing. Um, so here I have my uh, fixed capacity vector with a capacity of 3. Um, its current size is two. It's only got two blobs in it. Um, they are both in some state. And I am move constructing into W. That is, I am not relocating here. I, am not, I don't want to end the lifetime of V. Um, but I do want to move its contents into W. Well, what boost container actually does is call the move constructors of each element. Uh, that means that what I am left with on the right side is a, uh, a, a two element a uh, static vector um, in the boost world, uh, and it has two move from blobs in it. And so when I destroy v, now I'm going to have to call the destructors of those two blobs. Uh, this is inefficient, and it's kind of unsafe, because if anyone tried to use that vector, they'd say, oh, it's got two elements, but they're in a move from state. This is not useful behavior, and it is inefficient behavior. Um, what I would like to do is relocate those two blobs, that is, move and destroy them in one operation to relocate them over to there and their lifetimes in V. V's size goes down to zero, so I have to manually set that in the move constructor. Right? Here's the move constructor up here, right? Um, 
That's what I'd like to do. That is more efficient. When I go then to destroy V, uh, there's nothing in it. I don't call any destructors. And that operation of moving those two blobs over for a vast majority of types like shared putter and unique putter, that's a mem copy. Let's use std promise. std promise is trivially relocatable for the same reason shared putter is. Uh, I have a test function here. It takes a fixed capacity vector uh, of 100 capacity, so a very large one, and it returns it by value. It took it in as a parameter. It needs to return it in the return slot, so this is actually going to make a copy by implicit move. Um, so it's going to call the move constructor. The move constructor of our fixed capacity vector uh, is going to use uh, relocate. Uh, slow is not defined in either case, I think, here. Um, relocation with the P144 compiler uh, just calls memcopy. Right? I just mem copy those promises over, and then also I don't have to destroy anything. So I don't even call the destructor of promise. I don't need to. On the other side, it is calling the destructor of promise and the move constructor of promise. Um, and those are non-trivial. Um, and they could even result in uh, calls to operator delete and so on. Now, uh, that code will be unreachable, but the compiler apparently doesn't know that. Because again, I get a factor of two savings on my code size. Application number three for relocatability, uh, move constructor again. Move constructor of a type erased type such as std function or std any. Uh, here again, very similarly, I have inside the footprint of RHS, I have a blob object that I have wrapped up and I have forgotten everything about blob. Right? Because I've, I'm type erasing it, all I know is in the case of std function, um, you know, how to call it, how to copy it, anything that I put into my uh, list of affordances, um, which usually corresponds to something like either explicitly a vtable or something that I like to call a manual vtable, which is what we've got here. vptr here is not the actual v pointer. RHS is not a polymorphic type. It's a std function. Um, but it has this member called vptr that points to a table of function pointers that, that records everything that we need to know, right? type erasure. Um, so what options do we have to get the data from RHS to, uh, to LHS in the move constructor? Uh, one thing we could do is we could type erase the move operation and just say, OK, um, hey, blob, move yourself from here to here. Uh, we go through the v putter to our move operation, and it leaves RHS in an engaged state, but a move from state. That means it's dangerous to call, um, and it's not very efficient either, because now we have to destroy the blob when we're done with RHS. Um, libc++ function uh, will actually make copies of things that fit in the SBO, um, even if they're non-trivial. Um, so I would say watch out for that. Um, so moving is inefficient and bad. What else can we do? Um, well, we could move and destroy, right? So rather than leave a moved from std function in an engaged but moved from state, let's actually leave it in the disengaged state. That is more uh, honest to our users. It's been moved out of. We might as well make it empty. So we'll do that. That looks like that. We move just like before. Then we destroy the blob and we reset the vputter to point to the uh, vtable for an empty std function instead of a full std function, um, instead of a std function holding a blob, I should say. Um, moving there is inefficient and bad. Notice we're now making two uh, virtual calls through function pointers to move and to destroy, but we're calling them one after the other on a, on a destination and a source. Now you're thinking with relocations. right? We combine those into a single function pointer called relocate. Um, and uh, we can do it in one call, and that relocate is probably trivial. Uh, libc++ std any does this, because it was, had the benefit of being designed you know, a decade after std function. Um, so now we can do something cool. Look at this line. Right? We, we're, we're calling the relocate function of a blob, or of some t that has been type erased. All we care about is, hey t, how do you relocate yourself? If t is trivially relocatable, we don't have to actually call its move constructor and its destructor. That would produce, for every, for every t, it would produce a different relocate function. Uh, however, for all the t's of the same size, which are trivially relocatable, we can just point all of those v-pointers to the exact same function that does a mem copy for every t of that size. Right? Any t that's trivially relocatable, we can have its relocate pointer point right there. Uh, that means we can use the same single piece of code for double, which is 8 bytes trivially relocatable, int star, 8 bytes trivially relocatable, unique putter of int, 8 bytes trivially relocatable. All of those things, I can make my, uh, I can put any of those in a std any. Uh, the relocate pointer of that vtable will point to that exact piece of code. Instead of having many different pieces of code that the linker has to resolve and then they're all cold at runtime, I can have a single piece of code and it can be hot at runtime, relatively speaking. 
So less work for the linker, less work for the instruction cache. Good stuff. Application number four for relocatability. With a reliable way of detecting trivial relocatability, we can avoid the small buffer optimization for RAPIs that are not trivially relocatable. Um, so if I'm implementing std any, um, I can say, OK, uh, I have a big small buffer. Uh, it actually can put a std vector right there, and I'm going to do that in my small buffer. Now, a std list would also fit into my small buffer, um, but I'm going to choose not to do that. I'm actually going to opt out and say, you know what? Because list isn't trivially relocatable, I'm just going to heap allocate it and keep a pointer to it, just like I would do for a bigger object. Um, what this means is that now my any itself is trivially relocatable. No matter what it holds, it, if it holds an object in its SBO, that object itself is trivially relocatable, and it's not harmed by moving it like that. Uh, if the object were not trivially relocatable, I would have it out on the heap, and I have a pointer which has ownership but is trivially relocatable. As long as I'm moving and destroying in the same operation, I can memcopy it. Application number five for relocatability. Uh, consider this naive user-defined class type. Uh, it's got a string and it's got a vector. Um, I call it naive because it follows the rule of zero. Um, now, that is great. I wish all of my code were this naive, right? It, it doesn't need uh, a copy constructor, a destructor. It, it can use the defaults. Um, but when you follow the rule of zero, uh, you're probably also not providing things like, uh, well, uh, equality comparison, for example, but also a swap. If I uh, take two capital P pairs and I call swap on them, and it doesn't, here I'm just for the sake of the line, I'm using std swap, even if I did the std swap two step, you know, using std swap, swap A, B, there is no ADL overload for pair. And so what's it going to do? It's going to call the template version from the standard library that swaps two T's in this fashion. We have A and B coming in. We make a temp and we move construct it from A. We then move assign B into A, leaving B in a move from state. Uh, we then uh, move assign from temp back into B, leaving temp in a move from state, and then we destroy temp. Okay? Simple. However, pairs are trivially relocatable. What should actually happen in this case? We don't need to do all those move constructions and destroys. None of those are trivial. That's very complicated. Instead, knowing that these are trivially relocatable, why don't I just swap the bytes? All right, so I take A and I relocate it down into buff. That's a mem copy. I take B and I relocate it into where A used to be. I take buff and relocate it into where B used to be. I don't need to destroy buff. There's nothing there. So with the swap that's currently in the standard library, uh, the, the unconstrained one, uh, there are four operations happening because I'm counting that closing curly brace where the destructor of temp gets called. Four operations. Uh, there are three different things going on, move construction, move assignment, and destroy. None of those are trivial for shared putter. None of those are trivial for promise. None of those are trivial for a lot of types. Um, however, if I know that my T is trivially relocatable, I can use the one on the right-hand side, uh, three invocations of one operation, and that one operation is memcopy. Uh, Michael. I don't have to destroy the pair. I am, I am destroying it three times. Uh, each relocate there is doing a move construct and a destroy. The constructors and destructors are balancing out. When I get done, there's nothing in buff. Previous example with the temp. Previous example with the temp. Your temp swap is destroyed. Yes, that's the last step. That curly brace is bolded on this slide. You just can't see it. Good? Bryce. Is the use of char instead of byte significant here? Um, I think you could use byte. It would be fine. I prefer char because okay. why would I use std byte when I could use a built-in type? Um, so, uh, oh yeah, David. Instead of using a temporary there, could, you, could you have used the XOR-based uh, swap since these are? Could I use an XOR-based swap? Um, yes. I'm not sure that that would be a win on any actual architecture. Um, I do think that there is room in the C library for a mem swap. Right? We have mem move, we have mem copy. Why not mem swap? Then the uh, implementation could use you know, SSE or whatever it wants to do. I just meant because of the definition of trivially re relocatable. Does trivially relocatable imply that you're allowed to do that? Trivially relocatable does imply that I'm allowed to do this, definitely. Um, with minor caveats about um, partially overlapping objects, which uh, are already kind of messed up. Um, so benchmark, or 
I say potentially overlapping subobjects? That's what I should have said. Anyway, um, benchmarkings did rotate. Um, so when I rewrite swap uh, for trivially relocatable types, that actually has massive effects on any algorithm that is based on swap. And as Sean Parent will tell you, most algorithms are eventually based on swap. So I didn't touch the code for std rotate. You know, I don't want to touch the code for std rotate. Um, but it looks like it must use swap at some point. Because if I call std rotate with you know, random inputs n and k, and I look at what kind of assembly libc++ generates um, with the uh, with my branch here, I got 131 lines. With the uh, master, I've got 176 lines. And notice, in the 176 lines, we've got calls to operator delete. Why are we calling operator delete from std rotate? Well, because it thinks that it might need to destroy something. right? It, it does a move construct, and then it does a destroy. And the destroy says, compare that putter with null putter, and if it's not null putter, delete it. Now, I happen to know as a human that this this code here, this, this operator delete, that can never get called. right? It's definitely never going to deallocate any vectors as a result of rotating a single vector. Um, but it doesn't know that. The compiler has to generate these calls to operator delete and so on, even though as a human I know they're just going to get skipped. That code must be dead, because I'm never deallocating anything as a result of redoing this rotation. Does trivially swappable imply does trivially swappable imply trivially relocatable? Um, I don't propose trivially swappable. I do have a blog post about it that you may remember from a while back. Um, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, uh, yes. Uh, so by this point, having seen all these applications, you're probably thinking, I really want this thing. Um, so let's talk about how you can get this today um, in various existing code bases. We're going to talk about Facebook, uh, Bloomberg, and Electronic Arts. Um, so EA is the ones who I think have had this the longer. They did a proposal um, not including this, but including a lot of other stuff from EASTL way back in the C++11 cycle. Um, this was not included in that proposal, um, and I don't think it would have been accepted at that time anyway, because we got move semantics around the same time. Um, this is their documentation for it. Uh, what they do is they give you this macro, EASTL, declare trivial relocate. Um, you annotate all your types with that. Um, and then when you use the EASTL vector, that's not a std vector, that's an EASTL vector. Um, it's erase, insert, uh, reallocate, et cetera. Uh, we'll be able to use memcopy to uh, relocate objects. It says it's very useful in allowing for the generation of optimized object moving operations. Right? Uh, categorizing uh, objects as trivially relocatable or not is something that no compiler can do, as only the user can know whether your type is trivially relocatable or not. Uh, Bloomberg BSL has something very similar. Um, it's in the BSL MF for, I think, Metafunction namespace. I hope it's for Metafunction. Um, it's called Is Bitwise Movable? And they spell movable the way that I would love the standard to spell it, but they don't. Um, allows generic code to determine uh, whether type can be destructively moved using memcopy. Notice I'm not using the term destructive move, um, but we will see later. In part two, we'll see a paper that uses that term. Um, so again, anytime you have the following pair of operations, a placement new, which is the move constructor, or in this case, the copy constructor, um, either one, I guess they say, and then I immediately destroy the source. Uh, that's a relocation, or what they call a, a bitwise movable operation if I can replace it with a mem copy. Right? And this would be how I would use it with my uh, naive class pair here. Uh, pair contains a BSL string and a BSL vector. Those are both, I happen to know that those are both bitwise movable types. And therefore, I can use this. This is a neat syntax. It's still a macro, but uh, it attaches a member, uh, member type def to class pair uh, that enables that trait. And again, I, there's a uh, type trait that I can set. So we're seeing there's a pattern here um, the warrant and then the type trait. Um, Facebook folly has by far the most quotable explanation of relocation semantics, but I'm just going to put it up here and I'm going to let you read it for about a minute. This is from their, their readme. What we want is a teleporter. We don't want a cloner and then you shoot the original. We want a teleporter. 
and so Folly here. Uh, so Folly has the same thing. And I'm going to pick a little bit on Folly. Uh, I'm going to show you how to break it. Um, I'm going to imply that its developers have written bugs. Um, this is not because Folly is poor quality code. Uh, in fact, it is relatively high quality code, um, certainly above average. Um, but its, it's big selling point for me is that it's highly comprehensible. It's on GitHub, and you can go read it, and it doesn't use a lot of crazy you know, underscores and macros and, and things. It, it's pretty readable. And that means it's easy to find its bugs. Um, with apologies to Tony Hoare, there are two ways of constructing a software design. One way is to make it so simple that it has obvious deficiencies, and the other way is to make it so complicated that its deficiencies are not obvious. All right? Everything has deficiencies. Folly has the advantage that it's easy to find. Um, so Folly FB vector is just like uh, std vector, bsl vector, eastl vector. Um, but whereas all of those will be quietly pessimized for non-trivially relocatable types in Folly, you're actually only ever allowed to use FB vector with trivially relocatable types. They didn't bother to write the slow code path. They will actually static assert if you try to put something in them that's not trivially relocatable. Unfortunately, they haven't got a reliable way of detecting that. So again, we fall back on providing a warrant, right? either through a template partial specialization or uh, they have a macro that wraps that partial specialization, right? just like uh, EASTL did. Um, this is what a warrant looks like according to the Folly docs. Um, but there are downsides of explicit warrants. When you're using these explicit warrants, Right? When, you're, when you're telling the compiler something about your type explicitly, saying, I promise that this is trivially relocatable, um, there are two downsides. The first one is you have to know how to communicate that to the compiler. You need to look in the docs and read the, uh, the name of that macro and figure out how to use it. Um, or it says you need to specialize this template, and then you have to figure out how to write a proper template specialization. By the way, did you notice uh, the Folly docs don't know how to write a partial template specialization because they, they forgot the template brackety brackety bit? Um, so that's a problem. You know, most people, uh, you know, people in this room probably know how to write a template specialization. People outside this room who would benefit super greatly from a 3x code size reduction don't know how to write partial template specializations or explicit specializations. Um, so it would be nice to have a syntax that was usable by normal people. Uh, in fact, that syntax would be really nice if it were nothing, right? Capital P pair should just be trivially relocatable. I shouldn't need to tell anyone anything. Um, and with explicit warrants, you need to know when to write one. You need to know whether your type actually is trivially relocatable. And again, developers have a history of getting this wrong. Uh, here is the folly uh, traits.h header so far. When you include folly, you get this for free, and there's no way to turn it off. Um, they don't promise anything about MSC, uh, the Microsoft compiler, but um, they say, yeah, vector is trivially relocatable, deck is trivially relocatable, unique putter is trivially relocatable, shared putter is trivially relocatable, as we've seen, and std function is trivially relocatable. So if you compile it on libc++, where std function is not trivially relocatable, everything breaks at runtime, silently. Um, also, they are using the uh, template specialization for two parameters, with vector, deck, and unique putter. So if you pass an allocator or a deleter, which is not standard allocator or standard default deleter, uh, that could also cause some problems. So let's break FP vector. So <clears throat> here we have uh, my little main function. Um, does anyone have the capability right now to live test this on a, on a Folly distribution? Because that's something I wasn't able to do online. All right. Well, I promise. I give you my explicit warrant that this code will, will break. Um, let's see how. So I create a std string. Right? Uh, it allocates that string out on the heap because I deliberately made it too big for the small string optimization. And then I'm going to take that string and I'm going to capture it in a lambda. I'm going to capture it in a lambda so it becomes a member of the lambda. Lambda has one member named S, which is a string that has a pointer out to the heap. I'm going to take that lambda and I'm going to wrap it up in a std function. Now libc++'s std function looks like this, right? just like we saw earlier with my type erasure example. It has a pointer, which I called vtable earlier. It calls it mgr manager. It has a pointer to where the object is stored. Normally, pointer would point out on the heap. Right? We put the lambda in it. Pointer points out the lambda on the heap. Um, but in this case, uh, the lambda is actually small enough. It's only 24 bytes, right? because that's the size of std string. Um, it can actually fit in the 24-byte small buffer optimization of libc++ std function. So we're going to put it in the SBO. Uh-oh. All right. Now we're going to take that std function, and I'm going to emplace it into a vector. So there's my FB vector, and uh, it's got room for one std function. I'm going to put my std function in there. 
And then I'm going to reserve capacity plus one. It doesn't matter what the capacity is. This is going to trigger a reallocation for more capacity. Let's say capacity is now two. I heap allocate space for two items. And now FB vector believes that std function is trivially relocatable because of that explicit warrant, which was wrong. So at this point, it's going to do memcopy. That's all it knows how to do. It's going to memcopy manager and pointer down there. If pointer had the value 0x42 earlier, it has the value 0x42 now. It points the same place. That same place is to the small buffer of the now destroyed old object. Now, I get the first element of my vector, and I try to call it. That follows manager to find out how do I call a thing, and it follows putter to find out what is the value of the string s. That's been moved from. Now we try to call this did function, dereferences pointer, and boom. And actually, sorry, on this slide I should say I said s was moved from. Not really. It still has the same bit pattern. Um, but of course, that memory is deallocated. So if someone else has been calling malloc you know, or, or operator new, they might have gotten that memory and put something else there. So we get garbage. All right, so handwritten warrants are bug prone. Folly FB vector relies on handwritten warrants written by the Folly developers. They get them wrong. If they didn't help you, uh, then you would have to write it yourself, and you would get it wrong even more surely. I guarantee. You know, the, the Folly developers are smarter than you, generically, average person. Um, they get it wrong, average person's going to get it wrong too. So handwritten warrants are usually wrong, because generally, uh, if you're writing a warrant for code you didn't write, that means you have to know all the internal details of the library vendor's implementation. Right? Just because you're a domain expert on Folly's traits.h doesn't mean you're a domain expert on libc++'s std function. You can't necessarily warrant it for somebody else. Uh, you're going to get it wrong if you try. Uh, and they don't scale. Right? My capital P pair, I can't put that in an FB vector because I didn't say it was trivially relocatable. And remember, FB vector alone out of these implementations uh, rejects types that are not trivially relocatable. It says, I don't think I can memcopy that. Now, of course, it can memcopy it, but I haven't told it so. So I would have to add the warrant. And suppose I change that vector to a list so that my type is not trivially relocatable. The symptom would be the same. Folly would say, I can't put that in an FB vector. Give me a warrant. And I would say, all right, here's your warrant. I would be wrong. I would have undefined behavior at runtime when I tried to iterate over that list. So adding warrants is error prone, and it is just too much work uh, for the developer. I don't want to have to warrant explicitly for all of my code, or risk it not compiling or pessimization. Enter P1144 object relocation in terms of move plus destroy. Uh, this is a proposal uh, that is on R3 now, although don't read too much into that. Uh, the most recent version is after Kona, after I got a little bit of feedback there. Uh, the target for this proposal is C++23. It's certainly not going to be in 20. 23 is the optimistic, like, if anything happens with it, it might happen then. Um, it is a uh, full package, batteries included, uh, core language feature, type traits, library algorithms, all this stuff uh, to, to give you the full package. Um, by design, it, it preserves the correctness of all your existing code. We don't want to start memcopying around things, even your own things, um, when they can't safely be memcopied. So it will be very conservative and try not to break your code. Also by design, a design goal is to perform, preserve conformance of all C++17 library implementations. Right? A library vendor has to add a type trait and a couple of algorithms. Um, but it is perfectly valid for the type trait to always return false. Um, I'm not saying that libstdc++ has to go and make their std string trivially relocatable. Uh, that would be the second ABI break for their std string in a couple of years. Um, and uh, they're not going to do that. I know that. So uh, the proposal is written to make it so that library vendors do not have to make std string trivially relocatable. They don't have to make unique putter trivially relocatable. I don't know why they wouldn't. But that is a quality of implementation issue, not a conformance issue. As long as the type trait returns a correct or at least conservatively correct answer, it could just always return false. That would also be fine. And what matters is that we have that type trait that can tell us the optimization is safe versus the optimization either isn't safe or I don't know. Right? I don't know if it's safe. We'd better not do that optimization. But it enables the optimization in these cases. Um, so the proposal in a nutshell, uh, trivially relocatable, as I've been using it in this talk, becomes a term of art, similarly to trivially copyable, trivially destructible. These are operations that your type has, uh, and they can be trivial or not. Um, 
Just like for those properties, uh, the compiler exposes a built-in wrapped up by the STL into a type trait um, called std is trivially relocatable of t. Uh, just like trivially copyable, trivially destructible, the compiler will automatically propagate this trait, the, this property of the type. Um, so if you have a class that follows the rule of zero and all of its bases and numbers are trivially relocatable, then that class itself will be trivially relocatable. Um, also, any class that is trivially copyable is obviously also trivially relocatable. Um, all primitive types are trivially relocatable in general. Um, although, of course, again, that's quality of implementation. If there is a wacky exotic platform where int star happens to not be trivially relocatable, OK, you can detect that at compile time using the type trait and act accordingly. Um, Non-rule of zero classes. Any class with any special members at all is assumed to be non-trivially relocatable. The user's doing something weird. They haven't given us a warrant saying that they know what they're doing. Um, so we got to assume that this class is doing something that might not be tantamount to memcopy when I relocate it. Um, there is a way to give an explicit warrant. Expert users can use the attribute to give an explicit warrant. But the main purpose of this proposal is to eliminate warrants from the vast majority, the 99% of user code. Right? If you follow the rule of zero or you use standard library types, you're not going to need an explicit warrant anywhere in your code. Yeah? Uh, why, why do you use uh, uh, new attributes for this? Why don't you use the to trade? Like it's why do I use an attribute for this? We will get to that later. Um, but uh, short answer is people don't know how to write template specializations. Does that help? All right, moving on. Um, P1144 is, as I said, implemented on Godbolt. Um, it, uh, you can go test it right now. The keyword is P1144. Um, it's built from a stock LLVM backend. Uh, there's a branch of the Clang front end that I maintain uh, that implements this stuff. There is also a Clang pull request out. Um, if anyone would like to help improve this code, that would be awesome. Um, and there's a branch of libc++ that implements uh, P1144's new library features, the algorithms, uh, making sure all the types are properly annotated, uh, giving the optimizations that we've been seeing in this talk. Um, so it has all the P1144 new library features. Uh, it also has trivially relocatable std any. I took that ABI break. I took an ABI break to give it trivially copyable std vector of bool iterator because that's not the case on std uh, libc++. Um, and the entire memory resource header and CTAD deduction guides for associative and unordered containers. And Marshall, I'm looking at you. Um, priority queue replace top, uh, which I have a blog post about the operation missing from std priority queue. Um, container adapters, which are conditionally trivial destructible, um, and string view support in std regex, thanks to Mark DeBaver. Um, so all this stuff is maintained in this branch, um, and Godbolt pulls from that branch. So if you want to use any of those things, that's the playground for it. Or send me an email, and I'll put your thing in there, too. Um, so you already know the entire feature, right? I, don't, I, I gave you the nutshell version, and now you are experts, because there is no non-nutshell version. Um, OK, there are two more little wrinkles. Conditional trivial relocatability. Suppose I have this class that is now a class template. Zero wrap is a template, a pattern for stamping out classes. Some of those classes are trivially relocatable, and some of them are not. If it follows the rule of zero, I get conditional trivial relocatability for free. Zero wrap of vector is trivially relocatable, because it follows the rule of zero, and all of its members are trivially relocatable. Uh, zero wrap of list is not trivially relocatable, because although it follows the rule of zero, it has non-trivially relocatable members. So it is not trivially relocatable. Right? That, that property propagates automatically using the rule of zero. So I get it for free. But what if I'm an expert? What if I decide that I really want to do my own memory management, uh, and so I'll pick a pair of int star and t, um, now, that pair itself will be either trivially relocatable or not trivially relocatable, depending on how t is. However, I'm going to add more semantics on top of this type. I actually want the int star to be owning, so I'm going to call new in my constructor and delete in my destructor, and I'm going to have to do some manual memory management in my move constructor. So uh, here, uh, my type uh, is actually not trivially relocatable. Um, its uh, move constructor and destructor are non-trivial. And uh, the compiler will say, OK, um, in that case, because it never follows the rule of zero, um, I don't know anything about it. And when it doesn't follow the rule of zero, I have to assume it is not trivially relocatable. So the line in green is saying, uh, expert wrap of std list is not trivially relocatable. That is true, and so it is green. It is good that the compiler figured that out. Uh, the line in yellow, well, that's not actually true. I could use memcopy. 
but at least it is not using memcopy when it shouldn't. This is merely a pessimization. It is going to generate totally safe code, but wouldn't it be nice if I could teach the compiler that expert wrap was trivially relocatable, or expert wrap of vector was trivially relocatable? Wouldn't that be nice? Okay? Following the, the use case, I hope. So what I could do is I could add the warrant to the template that says all my specializations of this primary template are trivially relocatable. This would be absolutely wrong. Right? This would say uh, expert wrap of vector is trivially relocatable. I've taught the compiler that, so it knows that, and it will use memcopy on that type. Awesome, I get fast code that is correct. However, expert wrap of std list also now has the attribute, and the compiler is going to think that it's trivially relocatable. It's going to use memcopy. I'm going to break all my list pointers. Um, and so that is red. That is actually undefined behavior at runtime. That is the worst thing that could happen. Therefore, I should not do the thing that I wrote in red. What should I do instead? Or actually, before I get that, let me just read that box out loud. Uh, if you give the wrong warrant, your code will be wrong. If you write a bug, your code will have bugs. This is still the chainsaw. This is the chainsaw that is in Folly. It's BSL, EASTL. They all have this. If I give a wrong warrant, I have bugs. The primary goal of this proposal is to let the compiler deduce trivial relocatability often enough in the 99% case that you don't have to pull out that chainsaw for every single problem. Usually, you keep the chainsaw locked up. And then, when you need to use it, you need to pay attention. We're trying to teach you not to use the chainsaw. But it needs to be there, because sometimes you have to cut down a tree. Um, so here's one way you could do it. This was the only way that was proposed in R0 of the paper. I just said, I like metaprogramming. Everyone should like metaprogramming. Uh, we make uh, partial specialization here for uh, expert impl. Um, so usually, it's not trivially relocatable. But in the case that the bool parameter there is true, I'm going to make it trivially relocatable using the warrant, using the attribute. And I'm just going to cut and paste that exact same code. That's all right. I like cut and pasting code. Um, and then I can inherit from that, follow the rule of zero. I inherit the trivial relocatability of my members and bases. I don't have any members. I do have a base. And my base will be trivially relocatable or not, depending on that template parameter, which is just saying, if t is trivially relocatable, I want to be trivially relocatable. Otherwise, I don't. Right? So up to R2, I supported only this mode of metaprogramming. And I did the initial uh, libc++ patch entirely in this style. Quick. Uh, no. Nope. Moving on. Um, conditional trivial relocatability 2. Um, this is the one that I propose in R3. In a, you can omit the Boolean parameter there. If you do, it's just as if it were true, just like no accept or uh, explicit bool, which is coming in 20. This is the same idea. Sometimes I want to be trivially relocatable. Sometimes I don't. So I take a Boolean parameter. If t is trivially relocatable, I want to be trivially relocatable. So I no longer need the metaprogramming. Um, I do have really long lines. If you have 80 column lines, this might not work out so great for you. That's why I originally resisted it. But uh, what it extends your lines, but it re or, yeah, extends your lines this way. Number of columns goes up, number of lines goes way down. So this was totally a win. I re-implemented my libc++ patch using this. It is much cleaner, much easier to diff, much easier to review. I think this is probably uh, what people need. Um, so we're proposing both. Um, and again, this does the right thing. Uh, quick. You're forced to put the attribute between the struct and the name of the class, yes. Uh, that is just where it goes for classes, unfortunately. Um, there's another option. This was proposed by John McCall in the Clang review. Um, I gave it the somewhat pejorative name, maybe trivially relocatable. The idea of this attribute is it's saying, I don't interfere with trivial relocatability. If my members and bases are trivially relocatable, I'm trivially relocatable even though I provided special member functions. My special member functions will promise to propagate the trivial relocatability of my members and bases. Um, so this is a much cleaner in this particular example for expert wrap. However, it is completely unusable for certain things like optional uh, or things that we'll see later in the talk. Uh, I'm going to skip these questions and move on. We'll come back to this. Um, so first question, isn't this all undefined behavior? Right? I'm, I'm memcopying objects around without ending their lifetimes. Isn't this a problem? Well, um, it is a problem in the status quo. That's why there's a proposal. Um, in R0, R1, what I basically said was, yeah, it is undefined behavior. Let's change that. Proposal says it's no longer undefined behavior to memcopy between trivially relocatable types. Problem solved. Um, however, it was pointed out that that does allow a user to make a copy of a unique putter by having a unique putter, memcopying into another unique putter, uh, and then continuing to access the original. 
So I need some way of communicating to the compiler and, and to the user. They need to agree that the lifetime of the source has ended. Uh, the way we're going to do that is we're just going to add a library algorithm std relocate at. It works just like construct at and destroy at. Um, it just says I do both of those things. I begin a lifetime here and I end a lifetime over here. A life for a life. Um, and so for non-trivially relocatable types, uh, relocate at is simply move construct plus destroy. For trivially relocatable types, this can be implemented as a memcopy, as long as we surround it with the appropriate compiler magic to begin and end lifetimes appropriately. In practice, that compiler magic will be a no-op. It will certainly compile down to no code. Um, but how do we achieve this? Well, it's similar to std bless. Uh, this is a proposal that was just accepted, I think, into the working draft um, by Richard Smith. Um, and its motivating example is something like this with a, a list node, right? something like std list. I'm allocating the list node. I get some raw memory from my memory allocator. Uh, and then, of course, I'm going to placement new a t into the t element of the list node. And then I'm going to set my next pointer to null pointer. Um, but if you're a language lawyer and you look at this, there is something wrong. Somehow I am able to start the lifetime of the t, but I'm calling the assignment operator of next. There must already be a next object there. How did the next object get there for me to assign to it? Why didn't I need to start its lifetime? Well, if I insert a call to std bless, or if I assume that uh, std bless is already magically called by operator new, et cetera, um, then I can solve this problem. So I've added an explicit call to std bless here. What does std bless do? It's declared, but it's never actually defined it's defined out of line in another translation unit. The compiler, when it sees my example code, has no idea what std bless does. So it must be conservative. It is not allowed to do optimizations that might break valid code. Um, so it has to think of all the possible things that std bless might look like. And it might look like this. Compiler doesn't know. Maybe what it does is placement new an entire list node, the t and the next, and then it placement destroys the t. If bless did look like this, then uh, this code would be perfectly well-formed and have well-defined behavior. The compiler has to optimize as if that's the case. The compiler is not allowed to break code that might actually look like this. Now, of course, in practice, bless is a no-op, but the compiler doesn't necessarily know that, or at least it can pretend it doesn't know that, right? We're not actually going to generate a call to an out-of-line bless function. The compiler can pretend that it doesn't know what bless does, right? So we can do the same thing for relocate at. Um, here's my easy implementation of std relocate at. Uh, we test the type trait. If the t is, I'm sorry, there should be a not on this slide. If t is not trivially relocatable, uh, then we do placement new and we destroy. Um, otherwise, we can use an out of line helper function, which I've called triv relock at, to fit on the slide. Um, when the compiler sees this line, it sees the declaration. It doesn't know what triv relock at does, so it must assume that it does the exact same thing as that other branch. All right, as far as the compiler's feverish imagination is concerned, uh, it might just you know, be able to relocate any type by calling its move constructor and its destructor for all the types in your program. It might look like that. It doesn't in practice, but it might. The compiler has to optimize as if it looks like that. Now, whoops, in practice, uh, the linker symbol for free lock at is just an alias for memcopy, and you get a call to memcopy. Uh, or even the compiler is just pretending it doesn't know what that looks like, and it, it generates a no-op. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that's the implementation strategy for a very dumb implementation that requires no smarts at all on the part of the implementer. The implementer has smarts. They can do smarter things. But it is the very low bar to entry to actually implement this. Um, end of part one. Time check. I have 40 minutes left. Oh, dear. Um, questions so far? Yes. Uh, is this a property of the class with respect to a particular allocator? Um, it, it, it is, you're talking about like, does the memory model affect this? And I would say yes, but the standard, the standard memory model only has one thing. If you're using a fancy allocator of some sort that's baked into your type, such as a fancy vector, um, it probably won't be trivially relocatable under this definition because here we're talking about what memcopy does. Anything where you can mem, you know, if you're saying I have stuff in a different address space and you try to memcopy from, from one address space to another, that probably doesn't work either. We're, we're working in the domain of these things like memcopy. But we'll come back to that. Uh, question there. These uh, libraries that you mentioned, like Folly and ESCL, that already do this, do they take care of the object lifetime problem, or they just pretend it 
uh, Folly BSL and EASTL, do they take care of the object lifetime problem? No, they pretend it doesn't exist, because in practice it does not exist. Once we get std bless and std launder and all these things, like maybe problems will start existing because compilers will start optimizing and then they'll have to do something. Um, on the other hand, if compilers started to optimize based on that, they'd break Folly and they'd break Bloomberg and they'd break uh, EASTL. So, you know, there, there's a equality of implementation issue there. Um, all right, so let's talk about things that relocation is not. Uh, my proposal is not Pablo Halperin's N4158 from a few years ago, destructive move. Um, the central question here, and I wrote a blog post on this that you can search for, uh, the central question is can I define my own relocation operation to be used by reallocation and so on, which is not quite memcopy, but is also still more efficient than calling the move constructor and the destructor. So my proposal says definitively, no, you cannot. I call move and destroy uh, through relocate at. Relocate at has certain special optimizations it can do for trivial uh, relocatable types, um, but that's it. That's, those are your options. It's either like memcopy or it's not. Uh, Pablo's paper said definitively, yes, there is an ADL customization point that you can overload to say, here's how you relocate my type. Um, this lets you support some use cases that P1144 does not. Uh, consider uh, GCC's std dec, for example. It has a never completely null invariant. It can, the container itself can be empty, but it will always have a heap allocation for that table of pointers to arrays. Um, uh, MSVC's std list is similar. It heap allocates a sentinel node. So it is never completely empty. It always has some state, even in the move from state. The move constructor needs to actually allocate a new node. Um, so because the move constructor needs to do a heap allocation, it's not no throw. Um, these uh, objects are trivially relocatable, but they are not no throw move constructible. Um, Vice versa, GCC's std list is no throw move constructible, but because you have to go fix up the pointers on the heap as we saw earlier, it's not trivially relocatable. Therefore, if I have a struct capital P pair containing a GCC deck and a list, um, it is neither trivially relocatable nor no throw move constructible. And again, you can go test this right now. Um, well, you can't test that type trait because it's not in libstd C++, my fork is of libc++. Um, but what that means is that if you make a vector of these capital P pairs, um, then uh, it is actually going to do copy and destroy, copy and destroy, copy and destroy. It can't use memcopy because it's not trivially relocatable, and it can't even use move construction because of the vector pessimization. Uh, so P144 says game over, it's going to make copies, suck it up. Uh, N4158 says uh, you can customize that customization point to uh, do a relocate on D and then relocate S non trivially, but because you're relocating it, um, you don't, you're destroying the original, you don't actually need to do that heap allocation. So you can do it no acceptly, um, even though it's non-trivial. Thus, pair can be made no throw relocatable, which means that you uh, don't need the vector pessimization. When you reserve and you, you move all these items down, you can actually do that with relocate. You don't have to make copies. Um, so here's how Pablo's paper would do it. You make an ADL friend, uh, uninitialized destructive move is the name he gave to it. Um, and you just call uninitialized destructive move using the std swap two-step. Right? We don't like that these days. Back then, that was how you did it. It works just like swap. That's how I would write an ADL swap, right? I do the same thing for destructive move. Uh, now it is no throw destructive movable. Now vector can do the optimization at once. Um, how do I tell the compiler that it is uh, trivially destructive movable? If I have, I have a pair uh, here that follows the rule of zero, it has a string and a vector, so it is trivially relocatable. Um, in that case, the only way to communicate to the implementation that this is allowed is to do that partial specialization. Anytime I'm having to write a specialization, danger, Will Robinson, that is very tedious. Uh, also, it is dangerous. Um, right? Because if you have to write a warrant, if you're writing a warrant, you're doing it wrong. I guarantee it. Um, so TLDR, um, uh, Pablo's proposal could achieve no throw relocatability in more cases, therefore it could avoid the vector pessimization in more cases, but it was not simple. It relied on the ADL customization point, it relied on reopening namespace std. Um, you did not really have a type trait to ask whether a type was trivially relocatable. Instead, what you had is a specialization point, like std is error code enum, that you can specialize. If you can specialize it, it's not really telling you about the properties of the type that the compiler knows about. It's telling you about some, some library thing that the compiler had nothing to do with. Um, so it's not a type trait. It's a specialization point. All right, what else is P1144 relocation not? 
Uh, Dennis Bider had a proposal a few years ago, P0023, uh, that proposed relocator. This is the syntax for it. It looks weird. Um, it adds a completely new operation called the relocator. A relocator is like a constructor. It's like a de destructor, but it's not either one. It's not a relocating constructor. It's not a constructor. It's a relocator. It's a new core language operation with its own core language syntax. It is not the same as move plus destroy. Obviously, it should be, just like move should be the same as copy. Um, you know, it's not the same thing except by convention, but it's its own operation. Um, there is a higher level algorithm, relocate or move, that says if your type has a relocator, I'll use that. Otherwise, I will fall back to move plus destroy. Just like move if no accept says if you have a move constructor, I'll try to use that if it's no accept. Otherwise, I'll fall back to copy. Right, the compiler can figure out trivial relocatability just the same way it figures out trivial destructibility or trivial copy constructability. It says, number one, are you relocatable? Do you have a relocator? If you do, is it defaulted and trivial? So in P0023, I have my existing C17 code. Um, I ask, is this type trivially relocatable? Uh, no, it is not. Is it even relocatable at all? No, it is not. It doesn't have a relocator. It has a move constructor and a destructor, so if I call relocate or move algorithm on it, it will be able to get move and destroyed. But I can't relocate it because it has no relocator. It's not implicitly generated for me because I didn't follow the rule of zero. Um, if I wanted a defaulted relocator, I would do that. That does the, the obvious thing. It relocates all my members and all my bases. Um, and the compiler can detect that it's trivial. So that was Dennis's proposal. P1144 relocation is not. Niall Douglas's P1029, uh, move relocating. Uh, this is uh, not yet abandoned, I think. Uh, it is a current proposal. Um, so here's my existing C17 code. Um, he's got a type trait we can check, right? Everyone follows the same basic pattern warrant and type trait. Uh, his type trait is is move construction relocating, and since I didn't change my code at all, I don't get anything for free. If I want to get anything, I have to add an attribute. He's using an attribute just like me, he's putting it somewhere different. He's putting it on the move constructor, and now I can check that the compiler knows move construction is relocating, whatever that means. What does it mean? Well, um, good luck figuring it out. I do think that this paper is a little bit confused about what the issues are. Um, but it adds an attribute, just like mine. Uh, you put the uh, attribute on the move constructor, and when you do so, it indicates a property that the entire class has, a relationship between the move constructor, the destructor, and the default constructor in this case as well. If your class is not default constructible, then you can't use this attribute. Um, the relationship that we're indicating with this attribute is that when I move construct from S to D, leaving S in a moved from state, the moved from state of S is exactly equivalent to the default constructed state. Um, and additionally, when I destroy that default constructed state, it's a no-op. Even though it's not trivial. If I had a trivial destructor, the compiler would already know it was a no-op. So I have to warrant that destroying a default constructed T has no side effects. Um, and also, possibly default constructing a T has no side effects. That one is really unclear, but it, somehow the compiler knows what a default constructed T should look like, and it can like make one on demand. I, I don't really understand this. Um, and also, uh, implicitly, no operation on T cares where the T is physically located in memory, because one of the effects of Niall's paper, in fact, its main motivating reason for existing, is to be able to pass these move relocating types in registers. Um, if I have a widget um, and I call its constructor and I find out where it was constructed and later I destroy a widget, it had better be destroyed at the exact same place unless I said something to, to opt out of that. So in his case, the thing to to opt out and let the widget be constructed over here and destroyed over here is you put this attribute on it. You say, I move relocating. Therefore, it's OK to construct me over here and then sort of mem copy me all the way over to here. Um, my paper, again, does something similar using an attribute as well. Um, but my paper does not change the ABI, again, because of the requirement of backward compatibility. Um, so Niall's paper proposes a property warranted by an attribute. It's very complicated. Uh, it needs default constructability. Um, it deliberately, explicitly has ABI implications. Uh, no vendor uh, would be able to put this into their standard library without an ABI break. Um, that is, you couldn't make, for example, a move relocating std unique putter event. Um, if you did, it would be returned directly in RAX instead of being returned on the stack, um, and that would be an ABI break. Um, so in my opinion, Niall's paper forces vendors to choose. They want the status quo, where nothing is move relocating and the ABI stays the same, but but uh, users get absolutely no benefit. Um, or 
Uh, they could take the ABI break, pass unique putter and registers, really annoy all of their users who care about ABI compatibility, uh, but make their other users happy. Uh, P1144, on the other hand, I am trying to get the best of both worlds. No ABI break and, as we've seen, 3x reduction in code size on a lot of examples. P114 relocation is not something related to Niall's proposal. Clang has a very similar thing for allowing you to pass classes in registers. And I have a blog post if you search Arthur Dwyer uh, Trivial ABI. You'll find uh, a blog post that goes into more detail on Trivial ABI. It's a Clang specific attribute. Um, GCC might get it at some point because it is standardized in the Itanium ABI, or at least there's a proposal to standardize it if it's not already in. Uh, the Itanium C++ ABI defines what it means to be trivial for purposes of ABI. Basically, it means you follow the rule of zero and you fit in a register and you know that kind of stuff, maybe a register pair. Um, but if you don't follow the rule of zero, uh, then it doesn't matter how small you are. You're going to get passed on the stack just like any other large class. Um, if you want to be passed in registers, which something like unique putter could be, um, then you just put this attribute on there. Uh, that communicates to the compiler uh, that this class, for purposes of ABI, should be treated as if it followed the rule of zero. Um, it still has uh, all of these non-trivial member functions that must get called at the appropriate times. Someone is responsible for destroying the unique putter. But to get a unique putter from a caller to a callee, uh, we can pass it in a register. Um, so without trivial ABI, if I have a unique putter like type, um, it's going to get passed on the stack. Its address gets passed in RDI. You know, I, I load it up. I do some stuff um, with trivial ABI. Uh, it gets passed directly in RDI, uh, and I can just re you know, move 42 directly into it. My code gets a lot shorter, but this is definitely an ABI break. Uh, that, that's nice. The attribute has ABI right in the name. It tells you what it's doing. Um, so with Trivial ABI, uh, it goes in the Itanium ABI. It affects the calling convention. Since the parameter is passed in a register, that means the caller sort of gives it up to the callee. It just puts it in a register, and now it's gone off, and the register has been trashed when I come back, so how do I destroy it? Well, as the caller, I cannot destroy it anymore. That means the responsibility for destroying parameters must lie with the callee. MSVC already does this in every calling convention. It's callee destroy, but Itanium convention is caller destroy by default. Trivial ABI changes that. I might have a non-trivial destructor, but now it is the callee's responsibility to call it. Um, it does not elide or eliminate the observable side effects of move constructors or destructors. Therefore, it is orthogonal to trivially relocatable. If I had a vector of these things, I would still see move constructors and destructors getting called. How I pass them doesn't affect how I move and destroy them, how I relocate them. Um, so here's an example. I have A, B, C. A and C are trivial ABI. B is a regular old type. It fits in a register, but it doesn't follow the rule of zero. So when I call F with uh, A and then a B and then a C and then a B, um, they're going to get constructed in that order, at least with Clang on this architecture. Um, and if I didn't have trivial ABI, they would be destroyed in reverse order of construction. B, then C, then B, then A. However, um, the caller is transferring ownership of those uh, trivial ABI classes A and C to the callee. The callee is now responsible for destroying them, and of course the callee goes first. So they're destroyed in the order C, then A, then we return from the function, and the caller destroys the two Bs. So putting trivial ABI on a class can actually change the observed order of side effects of destructors uh, and possibly also move constructors. I haven't really thought about it. Um, so watch out for that. You know, it, you know, when you break ABI, you get side effects. Should the compiler swap the order of construction? That would be even more confusing, I think. Um, Moving on. Uh, sorry, 25 minutes left. We have a lot of slides. P1144 is not, not likely to help with persistence. This, I think, is getting back to Alfredo's question earlier uh, and also what I was talking with Bryce with before. Uh, so sometimes people hear this trivial relocation business that I can relocate a whole T in, in memory with memcopy. Just copy the bits, and it has the same stuff, right? Uh, it doesn't break. And they, what they take away is that T doesn't care what virtual address it's at. Um, something like a shared memory segment uh, or persistence to disk. So suppose I have a shared memory segment between two different processes. The memory is shared, it's mmapped, uh, but it's mmapped at different virtual addresses in the two processes. So I put it in the middle there and I'm giving the, the actual numeric memory addresses on the address space one and address space two. Notice it's at different virtual addresses in those two processes. Um, 
but it's just a regular old std vector, a normal std vector of long. When address space 1 looks at it, it sees a size of 2, a capacity of 3, a pointer of 0x1, zero one, zero one, whatever, uh, which goes right here. Boom, 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 there's my data. Cool. It sees a std vector and it can use it. On the other hand, in address space 2, where it was mapped at a different address, we see a vector of long with size of 2, capacity of 3, pointer of 1018, which is not 2618. It's some random pointer way up at the top of the screen. It's a wild pointer. We have garbage. We can't use this std vector. So boost interprocess solves this uh, by using fancy pointers, right? using the allocator model's idea of fancy pointers. Um, instead of using an absolute address, a machine address inside the pointer, um, it actually has a fancy pointer type called offset putter. Um, it stores, instead of storing a numeric address, it just stores plus 8. Um, so when we look at this, we see a fancy vector with size 2, capacity 3, um, and a pointer that points to this plus 8. So cool, we can access it. Over here, we see size 2, capacity 3, a pointer of this plus 8, which is 26, 10 plus 8 is 26, 18. It all works out great. Right? So boost inner process lets us share a memory segment between processes. Good, that was its design goal. Um, so both sides see a fancy vector and are able to manipulate it. So people think, uh, oh, sorry, one more slide. Uh, we can even dump this whole segment to disk, and then we can read it back later. We can map that file at any address, and it will be readable. It doesn't care what address is at. That's cool. Is this trivially relocatable? Is my fancy vector trivially relocatable? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? All right. Um, well, if you're looking at the top line of the slide, you might have guessed the answer is no. Go back to our familiar style of diagram, right? I tricked you by putting it all in a line like that. Um, the memory footprint of a fancy vector is just this V part. That pointer points out to something heap allocated. So when I relocate a plain old vector, I copy that memory address bit for bit, zero, uh, 1018, it still points to the same place, 1018. Plain vector is trivially relocatable. When I have a fancy vector where the pointer points to eight bytes beyond me, and I relocate that using memcopy. The pointer still points eight, eight, eight bytes beyond me. That's not going to point the same place anymore because I've relocated it. So I've actually broken my pointer. It points somewhere different now because it was stored as an offset pointer. That kind of fancy pointer is not trivially relocatable because it doesn't preserve its semantics when I copy it, when, when I memcopy it. Memcopy breaks offset pointer. Um, so if you want to use trivial relocation with this kind of thing, you need to create an, a, an actual type T. We need to warrant that some T is trivially relocatable, and that T's memory footprint needs to include all of this stuff. So within a single you know, shared memory segment, it has a vector named V, and it also has an entire uh, memory resource that knows how to allocate out of this arena, and it has the entire arena within its own memory footprint. So now, V will contain offset putters that point into arena, and I can then take the whole thing, right? I, I can take, here's my segment. Um, I'm using offset putters inside the uh, fancy vector. Uh, the vector has a fancy allocator, which also has an offset putter to a fancy memory resource. The fancy memory resource has an offset putter to the arena, and it has you know, bookkeeping information like used and capacity and whatnot. Now I can take this entire segment, memcopy the entire thousand byte segment, and I don't break any of my offset pointers. They still point within the new segment. Um, however, be beware wrong warrants. You're going to have to use an explicit warrant to teach the compiler this type is trivially relocatable. And then you are using the chainsaw. You have to make sure that whatever you put in that arena over there, if it's ints and longs and, and whatever, that's fine. If it's std regex uh, or std vector or std string, and they're not using those fancy pointers and pointing within the same segment, uh, that's not going to be fine. Right? So be careful when you're using the chainsaw. Try not to use it. That is the design goal, the reason for P1144 is to uh, eliminate the use of that chainsaw. So that was just a proof of concept. I expect in practice people won't use trivially relocatable for this kind of thing. You don't need to because you never memcopy one of these things. You mmap it. Um, it's being shared. You can't you know, just destroy it on a whim. Memcopying is super slow anyway. Uh, trivial relocatability is about small objects. It's about that std swap op uh, optimization that got us huge savings on std rotate. Um, you know, it, it's useful for these small things. It's not really useful for this use case. Again, and you had to write an explicit warrant, so I bet you got it wrong. Um, some open questions. Uh, is this what attributes are for? Someone asked earlier, why are you using an attribute? Why don't you just require people to write partial specializations? We definitely don't want to require people to, to use partial specializations. That would be terrible. They would get it wrong. We don't want them to do the chainsaw. Um, 
But in the case you have to write an explicit warrant, should it be an attribute? Um, should it be something else? Maybe it should be a new keyword. Uh, constrello, I think, would be the right name for that keyword. Um, you know, so if not attributes, then what? Um, but I think attributes are far and away the correct thing for this. Adding new keywords is a pain. People don't like it. Uh, parsers don't like it. They would have to, again, learn this. We're making a lot of work for people at EDG. We're making a lot of work for people uh, at Clang, uh, libclang, uh, and that's about it. Um, I think it would be healthy for the ecosystem to stop adding keywords and stop adding new syntax. And we've got an attribute syntax. Let's use it. Um, your tools will continue to work. It'll be great. Yeah? Attributes are also backward compatible. A compiler could just ignore your, your warrant. It, that would be perfectly conforming implementation. Uh, it would be a slightly poorer quality of implementation, but that's perfectly conforming as far as it goes. Well, actually, it wouldn't be perfectly conforming. I think in, the proposal says if you have the attribute, you, the, tra the trait must return true. But it would be very mildly inconforming and would not break anything to just ignore this attribute. Yes. Um, so in cases like our, uh, our relocatable segment, uh, maybe trivially relocatable, uh, John McCall's version does not suffice um, because it contains within itself fancy vectors and fancy pointers, which are not trivially relocatable. Just saying, I don't interfere with trivial relocatability is not good enough. Um, also for things like optional. Um, so given that maybe trivially relocatable is not sufficient and the chainsaw is necessary, is there still a benefit in providing the insufficient version for the benefit of people who maybe want a less predictable version of the chainsaw. Uh, I strongly believe not. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't object if people said, oh yeah, I totally want this, but certainly I, I don't think my coding guideline would ever say, hey, you should use this. Um, you know, the, the nice thing about the chainsaw is it's very sharp and it cuts cleanly. Not in real life, but yeah. It's a, yeah. Um, you know, but, but maybe trivially relocatable is like a chainsaw that like sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, right? And I don't, I don't know if that's better. Um, the, the, but it does not interfere with the main goal of the paper, which is to get people to stop writing template specializations and explicit warrants. Right? If there's an extra attribute that we never use, OK, I can live with that. Um, but you need trivial relocatable, possibly with the bool version. Um, isn't, 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 the trivial, isn't this just a different spelling of a warrant? Uh, it is a different spelling of a warrant. But the fact that it is built into the core language, that the core language can do rule of zero classes on its own, Sure. means you don't have to write nearly as many warrants, and you don't have to write them for standard library types where you're going to get it wrong. But, but, but just to be clear, like, this is a warrant. Yeah, this is an explicit warrant. warrant. You're, 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 there are less places that you need to use it, but it's still just as easy to put them yourself. Yes. Even the maybe trivially relocatable version is a warrant. Uh, it's a warrant with some sort of built-in checks and balances, but it is still possible to, to get it to give the wrong answer. Um, yeah. Yes, type and specializations allow you to, to put it anywhere, and they just don't work. And the, the paper goes really into this. Let's not talk about type traits anymore. They're terrible. Uh, th this open question is more about attribute versus keyword versus, like, I don't know what, right? Um, contextual keyword, maybe something else. You know, uh, where do you put the attribute? Things like that. Um, so another open question, technically, swap, my, uh, my one that just does the mem swap. Um, really, A or B might be a potentially, or an overlapping subobject, um, because it could be the base of a non-POD class type, and there could be data in its tail padding. Uh, the standard swap that uses the move assignment operator and so on of the base class would get that right. But if I just pick up the entire footprint and swap it, I might accidentally swap some members uh, in the tail padding. Uh, every vendor already does the wrong thing and stid copy for things like this. Um, so if they started doing the wrong thing and stid swap, would we care? Um, I tend to think no, it's not really a problem. We just maybe you know, figure out some way to teach that documented and move on. Um, um, but if it turned out that people cared and we weren't allowed to do that optimization, then you wouldn't get uh, number five, uh, where we uh, got uh, to rotate to be fast. Um, P1144 says that relocation is what you get when a move and a destroy come together. Um, however, the vector reserve optimization sometimes replaces copy plus destroy. 
Uh, insert actually replaces move assign from plus move assign to. When we're shifting everything down, can we use relocate there? We're not normally calling the move constructor in the destructor, so is it still OK to relocate? Or might the move assignment operator actually do something crazy that we need to preserve? Uh, to what extent can the library assume that a trivially relocatable type behaves normally? Um, if it has any special member functions at all, should we maybe make it not trivially relocatable? Uh, earlier versions uh, just said, uh, we're going to look at the move constructor and the destructor, and that's it. Um, and then there were some special cases for, oh, if you have const members, we actually have to look at the copy constructor and stuff like that. Uh, R3 post Kona does make that change and just says you have to follow the rule of zero, absolutely. If you have any special members at all, then you're not trivially relocatable unless you provide a warrant. This, I think, is much safer. It will allow us to do things like insert and erase um, without worrying about users complaining. That is the end of part two. We have some bonus slides and 13 minutes left. Um, I'll take a question, but I want to do the bonus slides anyway. Um, uh, so if uh, vector int is uh, trivially relocatable, what prevents vector int, comma, fancy allocator? Vector int is trivially relocatable. Uh, vector int, comma, fancy allocator of int is not trivially relocatable. How is that implemented in libc++? The answer is conditional trivial relocation as shown in the earlier slides, the first version of my patch used the metaprogramming approach. Now I use trivial relocatable of bool. And the allocator, you know, I can look at its construct and its destroy and its pointer type and, and find out that, oh, its pointer type isn't trivially relocatable. Or, oh, it has a non-trivial construct and destroy. You know, things like that. And I can metaprogram on that, yes. Um, all right, Gasper, ask your question, but then I'm going on. Are CMR allocators trivially relocatable? Thank you for asking that question. Um, so PMR vector, uh, he asked about PMR allocators. Um, so let's look at a case study erasing from a vector of PMR vectors. Um, and uh, if you're John Lakos and you haven't talked to me about this, come talk to me about this. Um, so uh, here I have a PMR memory resource and I have a, a plain old vector of PMR vectors uh, of ints. And I'm going to put three vectors back into this. So we're, it's gonna look something like this. I'm gonna put, uh, uh, what, what am I doing here? Uh, I am in placing into my vector, which is over here, a vector, uh, which has a PMR allocator and then a pointer to the head. And I'm color coding these by which of my three memory resources uh, the memory comes from and which memory resource the allocator points to. Um, so uh, here is my memory resource. You see I've allocated space for one int of value one, so that's my the thing my head points to. I'm not going to actually draw the arrows here because that would get confusing. But the red head points to the red one. Then I'm going to emplace back another item into my vector. So I'm going to, I need to do a reallocation here and, and move that down. That's fine. That totally works. I'm not worried about that part. Um, but now I'm going to emplace a vector with two elements of a value two that comes from memory resource two. All right, so it's color coded green. And now I'm going to emplace a third one. I'm going to color code it blue. So far, so good. This all works great. I was able to actually use uh, memcopy. This is trivially relocatable so far. But now it gets interesting because now I'm going to call erase on the first uh, item in this standard vector of PMR vectors. Now, erase can be implemented several different ways. In practice, it is always implemented the same way, but I'm not sure that it's the best way in a trivially relocatable world. What I could do is implement it via swap, the way I erase of an element of a vector is I swap everything down until I'm done and then I destroy the end. So I'm going to swap the first two elements of my vector because I'm trying to erase the first one. So I'm going to move it to the end and I'm going to get rid of it. Swap. Now, when I swap PMR vectors, I get undefined behavior because they have different allocators. Right? A PMR allocator is sticky. It sticks to that vector. When I call swap, I'm not going to swap those allocators. Those vectors have the allocators they have, but now they have different pointers. They have pilfered each other's pointers. So at this point, I already have undefined behavior, but let's just keep going and see how this plays out. Um, I swap, and I destroy. Boom. Right? The blue allocator cannot destroy the red pointer. I can't return this buffer, this red buffer, to the blue memory resource. That's just not going to work at all. I get undefined behavior. And that all happened. The original sin was I tried to swap PMR vectors with unequal allocators. You're not allowed to do that. So this would be a bad way to implement erase if I wanted it to work on a standard vector of PMR vectors with heterogeneous allocators. 
Now, Lakos would tell you never, ever do this, by the way. Right? Never have a container where its elements have different allocators. That would be crazy. They should all have the same arena. But the question for the standard library committee is, uh, should this work? Is it guaranteed to work? Even if I shouldn't do it, is it guaranteed to work? We, we deal with these questions a lot. We know nobody should ever do this, but if they do, what, what's, the, what's the behavior? Um, so we could also do erase. This is the way everyone actually does it via move assign. Um, so we do move assignment of the first vector to the zeroth vector. What does move assignment do between PMR vectors with different allocators? Well, they have different allocators, and those allocators are sticky. It can't pilfer the pointers. It has to make a new allocation in the memory resource associated with that vector, and then make a new in the green heap, and make a, and then at the end, we destroy memory resource. We destroy the, the blue one there. So this is successful. This has perfectly well-defined behavior. This is what happens today. But this might not be what you expected, because notice it's essentially making copies of everything. It can use the move constructor. In this case, we're doing ints, so it's fine. It would actually use the move constructor to, to move those twos and to move those threes. But it's doing heap traffic. Um, and if these are monotonic buffer resources or something, I'm, I'm using up my buffer. Um, I don't want to use up my buffer. Um, so this uses a lot of extra memory. And it might not be what you expected to happen. And it might be a lot slower than what you expect. If you have a trivial relocation, uh, or you have relocation at all, you can implement it via move and destroy. The first thing we do is we destroy the erased object. As long as it's no throw, you know, we, we know that's OK. Uh, and now we're going to uh, move construct the green guy into that empty slot. So we move construct. We pilfer the pointer. We set the pointer to null. And now we destroy that guy. And now we move construct and pilfer the pointer. And now we destroy. So this is success. And it's very efficient, especially if we're allowed to use memcopy to do that whole thing in one big memcopy. Um, but again, this might not be what you expected. right? Because I don't know what you expect. Maybe you expected the previous version, where we had a red allocator and a green allocator. Maybe you expected this version, where I have a green allocator and a blue allocator. I have no idea what people expect. Because again, the answer is never, ever do this. Um, but we have these different strategies for implementing a race. Which one should we actually use? Should it be implementation defined? Or should we say, you know, you get undefined behavior as in the first case? I don't know. Um, so compare the outcomes. Uh, we intend to erase that red first element. Uh, via swap, we get undefined behavior because we start mismatching allocators. Via move assignment, uh, we use a lot of extra memory, but we preserve the allocators. The first thing in the vector still has the, the red allocator. Uh, via relocate, uh, we're actually destroying the red thing and moving the others down. Um, so they all have different outcomes, and the standard would have to pick one. And so far, de facto, it has picked uh, the second one there via move assignment that uses a lot of extra memory. Um, and given that that one is distinguishable from the one using trivial relocate, now there's the question, well, if I'm optimizing a race for trivially relocatable types, and that changes the behavior, if I assume the PMR vector is trivially relocatable, the syllogism there implies that I must not assume that PMR vector is trivially relocatable. So PMR vector, because it has a move constructor that doesn't always you know, do, this, do the right thing, um, I might have to make it not trivially relocatable. And then I don't get the optimizations that go along with that. And that kind of sucks. So I would like to see some exploration of this uh, topic. Question in the back. Um, if is always equal is true for these allocators, uh, then yes, of course, they might be trivially relocatable. For PMR, that's not true. It's a runtime property, whether they compare equal or not. And in this case, in this example, they do not compare equal. Well, but I could still have a runtime check and then mismatch to the map or... I could loop over all of the thing, all of the elements of the vector, calling their comparison function, which is virtual, and asking, are you equal to every, is everyone equal, is everyone equal? All right, now I can do a mem copy. But why? At that point, I might as well just do the move and destroy. It would save the heap traffic, though, so I don't know. Um, so that would be another strategy. Um, cool. That is all my slides with four minutes left. That is awesome. Um, question. So the 
allocators have this construct function that you can be a member or a key function. Imagine it has a relocate task. Imagine the allocator has a relocate. Uh, Should this information be in the allocator instead of the class? The allocator, the allocator has no. The allocator is just a template, templated on T, and it doesn't know what T is. How could it know whether it's safe to relocate T or not? By a specialization of the allocator. So instead of writing a template specialization for is trivial relocatable of pair, you want me to write an allocator for pair. Uh, I don't want to write any template specializations at all. I want to use the rule of zero for pair and get this optimization for free. Yes, but the compiler can see whether functions exist and determine whether it's trivial uh, We should talk afterward because I don't think that that works at all. Um, or, or at least, if that works, it still requires you to annotate the class so that you know whether the class is trivially relocatable. I don't, think the specialization of the I don't want to write allocator specializations. That's, that's above my pay grade. Um, other questions? Applause? Question first. Uh, I know, I just, I, all right, applause first. <laughs> all right, question. Uh, do I understand correctly that you are proposing a list of standard library types which are guaranteed to be but there may be other types which are also trivially relocatable, but this is up to compiler and library development. Um, short answer, yes. Long answer, yes, but that first list is completely empty. I do not propose that any uh, standard library type be guaranteed trivially relocatable, because even the basic ones like string can't necessarily be made so um, without an ABI break. Um, so I propose that there be a list of types that are guaranteed trivially relocatable, and that list is empty. Everything else is quality of implementation. Okay. Uh, do you think that relocation work will, will confuse with uh, relocation turn in the uh, scope of uh, existence of file folder? Uh, yes. Am I, am I misusing relocate because uh, linkers already do relocations? Um, yeah, I mean, it's an overloaded term, but I believe it is uh, the best term. Uh, it is the term exactly as used by EA and, and uh, partly as used by Folly. And and bitwise, bitwise movable. Unfortunately, uh, that was a pre C11 term. Move now has a technical meaning, and these types are not trivially movable at all. Right? Like shared putter, not trivially move constructible, um, but it is uh, trivially relocatable. The move and destroy have to match up, though. So I, I believe using, using any variant of the word move for this would end up being more confusing. Uh, there could be another verb, but again, relocate is used by two of the three implementations in, in the presentation. So I think it's not going to be that confusing. Other questions? Awesome. Thank you, guys. <laughs>